All right, I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about who's sitting in prison in the United States um, in this lecture. Again, I want to refer you to the lecture notes. Please read those. I'll give you a little bit more. By necessity, I try to keep these short as possible. This one will probably be a long one, so I apologize. Okay, I want to. I get most. I get all of these data from the federal government. Um, there's usually a two-year lag of of reports. So if you were in 2020, the earliest data or the latest data you could get would be 2018, generally speaking about that. So basically when you want to see go what's going on late, the latest data, go back about two years. I update these every five years um, just so we can see bigger trends. Year to years can be meaningless, but when you look over time, you may see meaningful changes. All right, um, the United States, unfortunately, incarcerates a greater percentage than any other industrialized democracy in the world. That's our comparable U.S. neighbors. But in general, if you look in these reports, you will see that if you look at the country as a whole, the incarceration rates are highest in the South and in the West and lowest in the Northeast and the mid Midwest. And what that suggests is, remember, prison's a very expensive resource. you got to pay for somebody to be locked up. The latest data I had, which it's not published a lot, um, was in 2006 in Hawaii. It was about $20,000 a year if we sent somebody off to a private prison in Arizona. About half of our people were sitting there, and about forty grand um, in Hawaii twice as much, right? So it's very, very expensive. So your incarceration rate speaks to how you use prison as a resource to combat crime, if you will. Uh, Hawaii is right in the middle. Um, also, unfortunately, the federal government became inconsistent uh, separating state and prison federal systems in the last several years, and it becomes real difficult to find it. Um, but again, I refer you, These most of these data are found in a prisoner's in, say, 2020, et cetera, et cetera, right? That'll give you a feel of the difference between the states. Uh, I would sort of, those, those are sort of examples to compare, and you'll see um, differences there. Um, it, depending on what you're looking at, um, we sort of saw a peak, but as you'll see, it's hard to deal with that. I did find some state level data only that shows it is still growing, unfortunately. All right, so remember, we want to look at incarceration rates because we're going to compare apples to apples, okay? It tells you what percentage of people in your population are locked up. Okay, so these are state prisons. So remember, the vast majority of people sitting in a prison are there for they're serving time in a state prison, right? All of the things, I should say most, the vast majority of things that you think of as street crime where somebody might be incarcerated in prison, murder, rape, robbery, assault, stealing a car, etc., cetera, are street, street crimes. So each of the 50 states have their own set of state laws that define each of those crimes and the penalties for them. All right, so key thing to hear is to look at the dramatic growth since 1980. Again, raw numbers are kind of useless, so look at the rate. We'll say what percentage of our population are we locking up? So, over time, the latest data available at the time of this lecture, we're locking up four times the percentage of our population in our state prisons as we did in 1980. So that was the sort of beginning of this incarceration binge that I showed some data in the first section, or the first version, what do we call the first version? The first Prisons Part 2 lecture. This is the second Prisons Part 2 lecture, I apologize. Okay, again, here you can get an idea. Remember I said the vast majority of people are locked up? That's raw numbers and rate. Right, because the, there aren't as many federal crimes, so you can sort of see here that the um, I just wanted to show you the differences in the percentage of people who are locked up in each system. Okay, so the vast majority of people there are sitting there for um, 
the state level crime. I also wanted to show you the rate for federal prisoners only. I was able to find that for 2015. Um, it becomes, it's, you got to really look into the bowels of the report, do all kinds of stuff. They don't, they no longer list it in the main part of the report. And they're very inconsistent about it. But since the 1980s, we've seen a dramatic expansion of federal crimes and thus prisoners. Most or many, at least many, if not most of them, are due, but not all, are due to an expansion of federal crimes that are drug related. Okay, so prior to the night, prior to 1986, there were really no uh, federal drug crimes, with the exception of you know importing it into the U.S. or transporting it across states or whatever. Um, starting in 1986, there was a whole slew of brand new basically possession crimes on a federal level. Um, and they typically do have uh, higher, they, when they created that law in 1986, they had much stiffer penalties or longer prison sentences compared to most state systems, although state systems and legislatures have changed theirs as well since then. There was this whole get tough on crimes, war on drugs um, policies, which in the main thrust of which was locking up people for longer periods of times. What this kind of created was a little bit of double jeopardy, if you will, um, where if you had a certain amount of drugs, you were eligible for, for both a federal and a state crime. Okay, And so what tended to happen was if you may have seen this on the movies that the, you know, the federal FBI agent comes in and he kicks out the local guy and says, we're taking over. But, you know, in practice, I think a lot of the state agencies were probably in general happy to have that happen because it doesn't use up their resources. Um, I friends now with a wonderful retired FBI agent. He even told stories of there was this one guy in Maui who I guess had been popped many, many times for Lee on the drugs. And then at the height of the war on drugs, they took a big, gigantic Chinook helicopter, which is that one that has two rotors. Uh, they landed in a Maui. They went and got him, drove by the Maui jail or whatever that is. And he thought they were going to stop. And once he got into that helicopter, he knew he wasn't in Kansas anymore. Um, before he'd just gone to jail and been released, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what happened was the war on drugs really sort of, there was this big crack scare in 1986, and cocaine was definitely the most publicized drug of the war on drugs. Cocaine, but especially crack cocaine being the, was especially demonized. Um, I have another lecture where I show how crack, the federal crack penalties ended up incarcerating a greater, led to racial disparities in who's incarcerated for crack versus powdered cocaine crimes. But it was such a big deal. Two presidents gave nationally televised um, speeches from the Oval Office. Um, back in the day, I don't know if that still is the case, but when a there, you know, there wasn't a lot of cable TV news, but when the when the president decided to make a speech from the from the Oval Office, all three major networks would carry it, and it would be on live. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, so drugs were blamed for a myriad of social problems, including, but not limited to, violent crime, youth crime, gang violence, unemployment, and poverty. Um, and that's sort of these lurid images of drug users and drug dealers that led to these dramatic increase, well, led to the creation of federal laws against drug possession. Um, if you think about it, I'll just give you one example of some of the peculiarities of it, okay? So first of all, you could be popped if you had at least five grams of crack cocaine by the feds, right? I don't know what the limit, I'm sure any amount so you had to have at least five grams, which isn't a huge amount, okay? Um, I don't know what Hawaii's um, law was, but you couldn't have crack cocaine there either, right? So here's a, so that's sort of an example of them, each system having their own, their own laws. Here's a peculiar thing. If you were busted 
dealing within, I don't, I don't know the exact distance, but it was something like 200 yards, 200 meters from a school, you were subject to enhanced federal penalties. Even if you had less than, you know, five grams or whatever, it, it applied to not just crack cocaine, but the idea there is, you know, we're protecting our kids from, from these evil drug dealers. Even if you were dealing out of a house, which is not, you know, and you were never selling to kids, you were eligible for this enhanced federal penalty just by virtue of doing that. Okay. Um, why this, why did this occur? Um, imagine you have your federal legislators, your two U.S. senators, and Hawaii has two U.S. representatives, and they'll come and have town halls. And remember, drugs were seen as such a big, huge problem in the 1980s. Uh, opinion polls showed that Americans feared drugs more than they feared nuclear war, meaning it was a greater threat to our, our society. So there was heightened anxiety about drugs. So imagine... I go to a meet and greet or a town hall with one of my federal senators. And I said, what are you going to do about the drug problem, Senator? And, you know, imagine they go, well, you know, actually the way the United States Constitution was set up, state crimes, you know, that's a state crime. And that falls under the jurisdiction of just the, your state person. So not my job, man. Go talk to your, um, your state representative. Sorry. Well, back then, it was political suicide to be soft on crime or drugs. So that's what led to that political pressure. Um, they didn't want to be voted out of office, just like now. And so that was one of the things that helped create these whole new set of duplicate set of federal drug laws. Okay, and that's when Nesson creates that so-called double jeopardy, as I've described it to you. Although that's not, you know, perfectly correct. Okay, what I want you to do is these show who's, what torts of criminals by their most serious offense, okay? So violent is where you hurt somebody. Property is where you steal something. Drug would be a nonviolent drug offense, non-stealing, non-property drug offense. And public order, stuff like taxes, weapons, etc. Um, but the, here's the key is back then, um, one of the, the rationales for locking up drug users is people got high and they hurt people, right? Or they needed drugs and so they stole things from people, right? That would be property and violence, right? But if you're in there, the drug category here, you were not convicted, you did not hurt or steal somebody. You were just possessing the drug. Okay, so that's very, very important. These are non-violent drug offenders in that column. Okay, so you can see that the number of violent offenders drop. That makes sense, okay? But look, in the beginning, it's mostly violent offenders, right? That was so prison's expensive resource. To me, that makes the most sense in 1980, right? That 25% is probably people who are uh, importing drugs into the U.S., right? Um, and that changes so that you can see very few people are sitting there for violent offenses, in 2015, that makes sense simply because there's not a lot of violent federal crimes. But look at what happens to drug offenses. That explodes, right? Public order also gets bigger starting around 2000. I'm unsure of why that is, but I'll try to explain that um, in the next slide. But all I want you to see here is this. These percentages show you that it was the war on drugs that fueled the dramatic expansion of our criminal justice systems. Excuse me dramatic expansion of our federal prisons, okay? They're what contributed to the growth. Okay, here were the um, public order offenses. I'm not really sure. I was trying to figure out, like, why did that occur? And I, I honestly don't know. I'll just give you a guess, okay? But don't hold me to it. And if you have a better guess, please tell me. Um, I was thinking that it seems that there are an increase in public order offenses, especially weapons okay and then you also i'm thinking maybe I, I wish i had this prior to 2000 right immigration doesn't appear to change right i was wondering why that was i was thinking you know after 9 11 right but who knows um but weapons do go up and my only explanation would be um 
Mexican drug cartels are so well armed that they can literally shoot it out with their own army and they buy their weapons in the United States um, and bring them back to Mexico because it's illegal to buy assault weapons in Mexico or at least it used to be I don't know if it still is um, so that's my only explanation for the increase but I'm not certain and I just was curious about why that occurred all right um, unfortunately the federal government no longer gives us racial data for state prisons, federal prisons, etc. This is actually combining people, right? These were the latest data I could find. I could not find um, after 2006 separated and even um, this is the, that is the most recent data I can find. The ones that they're giving us now are kind of confusing because they give you just this, um, these weird percentages that are hard to interpret. Okay, but here's the important thing. Okay, we're looking at the incarceration rates by race. Okay, so black males are incarcerated at a rate almost seven times that of white males. And females, black females, right, are incarcerated at about three times the rate of white females. And then you can see the same for Hispanics, right? That's an example of what's called systematic racism, okay? It's not necessarily that these laws were written to um, target certain races. Maybe some really forward-seeking racist senators and uh, legislators were able to do that, but I think it more focused, it's more really a result of economic changes and um, focus on drug uh, incarcerating people in for drugs that are caught on the street, right? But there's a lot of explanations. All this says, all I'm trying to say is it's not necessarily overt racism, but there's something about the criminal justice system that leads to a greater percentage of black folk being locked up compared to white folk and same with Hispanic folk, okay? Um, sort of similar if you were to look at home ownership rates, right? I would imagine you see a similar pattern here, although not necessarily the exact same one. Okay? So systematic racism refers to a system that creates racist outcomes. All right. So it's very important to know that the way our, we're locking up people is an example of systematic racism. And if you're in one of those groups that are being locked up at a greater rate, you might be pissed. In Hawaii, I try, when, I, when I first came sort of being a professor in Hawaii, I tried to get some data out of this, um, the agency that runs this. Of course, they said, oh yeah, we'll get back to you, and they never did. Um, but my mentor had some data from our prison system in Hawaii from the 90s, and we incarcerate Polynesians at a greater rate than all the other races, particularly Samoan, okay? Um, so that's sort of like the Hawaii version of that. Okay. Here's the incarceration rate over time. Okay, just giving you a feel. Again, this is state and federal prisoners. All right, so you can compare it per year. Unfortunately, about that time in 2005 is when they start giving us combined, which is not useful because as I, I don't know, you remember from the previous slide, I said that uh, black folks got disproportionately targeted by federal crack sentences. And I have a lecture that shows racial disparities in federal prisons due to that. So, but when they combine them like this, you're unable to do that. Okay, but it just gives you a feeling of what's going on over time. Okay. All right. Look at this picture. Remember, I, so I've sort of complained a little bit about how the federal government has made these reports here, and it makes it more and more difficult to figure out what's going on in our prisons, right? So I remember when I first started creating these data sets way back in the day, I saw this picture, right? So it says, over half the increase in state prison population since 1990 is due to an increase in the prisoners convicted of violent offenses. Okay, so again, these are mutually exclusive, right, by most serious crimes. So 
if you're there for a drug offense or a property offense, you didn't hurt somebody and create a, you didn't do a violent crime. Okay. So what this suggests to me when I look at it, okay, is makes me feel good, right? I'm like, wow, that means we're really, prison's a super expensive resource and we're using it to lock up our more dangerous people, right? I mean, it, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the most dangerous is somebody who hurts somebody. The next dangerous is somebody who steals something from somebody. That's property, right? And then, you know, drug is, these are nonviolent, non-stealing, you know, non-property drug offenses. So that would be the third least dangerous, right? And then public order can be all kinds of stuff, um, being drunk in public, uh, not showing up for trial, etc. But when I look at that, I go, wow, that makes me feel real good. Wow, we're, we're spending this expensive resources in our states on what's most important. But then I started to parse these data from which I got, I downloaded a table from which these, uh, which this little figure is created. And let's sort of take that and look at it in greater detail. So it's true in the 1980s, we do have more proportional growth for violent offenders, right? Although public order offenders grow much more, right? Everybody grows. Okay, in the 90s. But in the 1990s, we see the biggest growth of violent offenders. But it, drug ain't far behind, right? Although when you look at that graph or that figure, that picture prior, it doesn't sort of suggest that, right? So it's true for that. Okay. So this is proportional growth is from where you started in 1990, where did you end up? So that gives you a feeling of how you are, when you're growing like that, it's what are you dedicating your resources to, mostly. Okay, so mostly we are dedicating it to public order offenses, followed by violent offenders, right? So public order is the least serious of all of them, and those are the vast majority of people getting locked up. That could even be like, um, anyway, I won't go into that. I won't, won't get too different, but that's kind of not good, right? When you look at that, that means in the 1990s, most of our growth was happening for the least serious crimes, right? But then, you know, at least violent is second, right? Okay, there was something called the Sesame Street game when I was a kid, and there was a song that's like, one of these things is not like the other, one of these things just doesn't belong. So I'm sorry about my singing. So look at the picture and then look at the growth. Okay. So if I don't ignore the 1980s, you can see that drug and public order are the big winners. Those are the ones that drive the growth over those 20 years. By far and away, it's drugs, way over violent. But when I look at that picture above, I don't get that feeling. The picture makes me feel good when I make, I had to create this table with my own calculations. And that basically says that in terms of where we're putting our dollars in the future and what's driving our growth are our drug offenders. Okay. This is just state prisons now. Okay. Not the feds. This doesn't include the federal prison. Um, what does proportional growth say about policy? Okay, um, I'll let you read it in the lecture notes. But in effect, we can't put everybody behind bars. It's a really expensive resource. And so you got to ask yourself, I mean, we're just starting to come to our senses about these sorts of things, right? Because, we, because of this astronomical growth, um, the vast majority of states. If there's, if it's not all the states, I want to hear about it. I'll go out on a limb and say my guess is that all states spend way more money on their prison systems than they do their college systems, right? And it's not just because we're biased because I'm a college professor and you're a college student, right? It's just like for the long-term health of a society, that's not a good thing, right? Putting people in prison, you know, it may make us feel good, but the um, 
it doesn't actually really help. About 95% of the people sitting in prison are going to get out one day. Um, and it's a really nasty environment compared to what you might have thought, especially on the mainland. I've heard Hawaii's not as bad. But um, on the mainland, you barely, pretty much got to um, join a gang, and most of them are race-based, to survive. And they're incredibly violent. And by the time you get out, you're pretty damn damaged. And so that's one of the reasons why we find is that once people get out of prison, they tend to go back. And I, you know, my argument to that is, yeah, you got some knuckleheads, right? But, you know, it's like if you spend 10 years in prison and all you're around is other prisoners, once you get out on the street, you don't know how to act. You haven't had a job. You don't know how to act. Your, the, uh, your whole way of interacting people has been changed, right? So... It's sort of philosophically not a good thing to be using our... And then, once you do it, right, okay, I'm also not going to say there's not a place for prisons. There is. I do want people who hurt people badly to be locked up, okay? That would be violent offenders. And I also want, if you steal a considerable amount, you know, you got to... Cons I want you to be locked up because those are bad things that you do to people. Public order and drug, though, you're not really hurting other people. Drugs, that's a, you know, maybe you're hurting your family. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to argue that with you, but um, most of the, our young men who don't have families, right, who go to prison. I'm not saying all, but most. Um, prison is an expensive resource, and in my opinion, you're free to disagree with me, but I'd love to hear your theory behind it, is we spent our resources towards growing the least dangerous sorts of prisoners. So I would like to see those numbers where most of the growth was violent, then property, then drug, then public order. Okay. So that sort of just kind of shows you how, you know, we're spending our resources on prison, which is very expensive. And then also just sort of my, when I looked at that graph, I was all happy, right? Then I got pissed. Okay. Take a look at the next slide, a little more plain English. I don't know about you, but proportional growth is hard for me to understand. So I just took sort of percentages, right? It's, it doesn't tell the whole story. It's not as dramatic. But you can see that drug offenders grow dramatically. Violent offenders go down. Property offenders go down. So you can see that that's what leads to the proportional growth. Proportional growth is sort of one way to look at it is pretend you start. I'll give one guy 100 bucks, and I'll give another guy 10 bucks. For the guy who I give a hundred bucks, I'm only gonna give one dollar a year. Okay, I'll just let's say a day. I give you a hundred bucks, I'm gonna give you a dollar a day. I'll take another person, I give him ten bucks, but I'm giving them ten a day. Over time, the guy who started out with ten bucks is gonna have a lot more money in his pocket. That's proportional growth. Okay. So that sort of says if you were to continue on this track, you know, um, not good. You're going to have less and less people in there for violent offenses, more and more people in there for nonviolent public order and drug offenses. Okay. All right. This is unrelated to that misleading graphic, but um, this is state offenses. I cannot find it for um, only state offenders after 2007. Okay, so it does appear to at least start to level off since 1999 a little bit, right? And maybe even goes down a little bit for drunk for drugs and public order in terms of percentage basis. But remember, that's not proportional growth. So at least that part is heartening to me. Um, you know, so I just wanted to see what happened since. Uh, that graphic that we saw. Okay, that's the end of the lecture.